introduce yourself first. I'm Robert Carlin. Um, I'm a former U.S. government employee, uh, and uh, I work with Spencer Kim at the Pacific Century Institute. Why did you become interested in North Korea and the Korean Peninsula in the 1970s? What were the situations in South Korea and North Korea at the time? I fell into working on North Korea by accident uh, because I was really <coughs> a China, uh, ex not an expert, I, I studied China. And I fell into North Korea and I was so fascinated by it. Uh, that I stayed with it this whole time. The situation on the peninsula in those years was um, tense, um, unsettled. Uh, U.S.-South Korean relations were not very good. And so there were, um, it was very different than the situation is today. Plus, South Korea was much less developed. I remember you mentioning when I started studying North Korea in 1974, I didn't think unification would not happen in the future. What were the reasons behind your positive outlook on unification at the time? In 1974, I don't, well, I don't think I started forming <clears throat> an opinion for a few years after that, but uh, West Germany was far ahead of East Germany. It seemed to me South Korea was becoming far ahead of North Korea. Uh, South Korea had all the advantages it had the potential uh, strength, not just military, but economic strength, moral strength, that it just seemed to me sooner rather than later that that, that power would become predominant on the peninsula. Uh, in 1996 and 2017, you participated in visits to North Korea. What roles did you undertake? and what did you discover during those visits? Uh, 1996 was my first visit. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I was in the State Department, and I was really, um, I had to go, because as, as someone studying North Korea, if you don't go to North Korea, if you don't see it and feel it and touch it, uh, you can't understand um, exactly what you're studying. It's more than a two-dimensional place. It's three-dimensional, and you have to understand that. So that was a very important visit to me. Uh, 2017, I'm trying to remember. Oh, I was, I was with a uh, CBS News crew, and we actually were able to view the parade. I think it was the uh, April 15th parade, Kim Il-sung birthday parade. Uh, and I had good discussions with um, uh, North Korean officials who knew my past experience dealing with them and we had a chance to compare notes where things were where they might where they might go yeah uh, at the time the US special envoy for North Korea Stephen Began stated that 2018 to 2019 was the most significant opportunity for North Korean denuclearization and you mentioned feeling envious of him during the time. What were the reasons that made that period a favorable opportunity, and what factors have contributed to the current situation not improving in comparison to that time? That's a very good but very complicated question, <laughs> right? So let's see if I can take it apart. Uh, 2018 seemed, um, from the outside, to hold great promise. President Trump at that time seemed willing to take steps vis-a-vis -vis North Korea that uh, no previous president or administration had taken to, um, to deal with the North Koreans on a very different level from a different approach. And it looked as if it, was, um, it might produce results. And the Singapore meeting and declaration seemed to me to be a very good beginning. Uh, it was the beginning of a journey you know, we didn't know for sure where it would end, but it looked like it was a good start. Things fell into uh, difficulties pretty quickly after that. There was misunderstanding, I think, about what the two sides thought they had agreed to. And then as we moved into 2019, the two sides grew farther and farther apart in what they thought they could accomplish. 
I don't know for sure what Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Un thought he could accomplish, but it looked as if he thought um, he'd made he'd be able to make great progress. And for whatever reason, uh, President Trump um, didn't understand, wasn't prepared to take the next step had advisors that were holding him back. The president himself had a lot of domestic political difficulties. And so, as everybody knows, the Hanoi summit was a disaster. It was a real turning point. Right? So, you know, whenever we change the power in our government, you know, those kind of stance change. You know, sometimes we emphasize we okay we have to be ready to the dialogue and also sometimes they okay we have to make more sanctions against North Korea so what do you think about the merits and you know bad sides of those two different policies most important thing is to be consistent and to carry them th over and through administrations so that the North Koreans don't see opportunities and don't feel when they've reached an agreement that they are, the agreement is being uh, torn up and thrown away. So consistency between administrations is really important. There's going to be a little bit of uh, fussing, no doubt, but uh, the core of the, of the policies should remain very closely aligned. When it isn't, it's very hard to, uh, to sit and negotiate with the North Koreans because they know what we agreed last time. And if you come up with something new this time, they say, well, what happened? We thought we had an agreement. So I don't think the oscillation is good between aggressive and diplomacy. I think the North Koreans respect the fact that we defend our own interests. They don't, they don't have any problem with that. But when we finally do reach an accommodation, an agreement, in which both sides are benefiting, uh, and we hold them to their part of the agreement, they expect us to follow through on our part of the agreement. That hasn't been the case. That was the case during the agreed framework, which is why we made so much progress. After that, we were not, for some reason, we were not able to do that.